welcome everybody. All right, there are a couple different versions. So if you did request the kit in advance, it was actually the water student modeling pack and you can see that on the left. There is also normally the um, water one cup kit, which comes with a few more pieces. Um, so you can see there's just some slight differences. The modeling pack has um, methane, whereas the one cup kit has ethane. You get a few more waters with the kit than you do with the student modeling pack. And um, they both come with a salt with a, a sodium chloride. We're gonna be in the videos focusing on the water one cup kit, um, but please feel free to model um, as you go along. Cheers, excellent. Oh, 40 years of teaching joy. Wow, that's amazing. So the first thing I want you to do is play with your water molecules. If you don't have the molecules or you'd like to just follow along with the videos, um, we do have a video just kind of exploring. I want you to look at what do you notice? What questions do you have? This is exactly what I do with my students. I give them a few pieces. So this is the water kit, um, the one cup kit, all the pieces laid out, and you just start playing with them. I have this, don't tell my students anything. I actually don't give them the cup itself. Um, so we haven't even addressed that this may be water. So just looking at how um, the molecules or pieces interact or don't interact with each other. So while we're looking at the video or you're playing with these molecules yourself, please feel free to drop in the chat. What do you notice? What questions do you have? You're clearly seeing that there's some red and white that like to bond to each other. Why are they sticking together? That's an excellent question. My kids always have that question. Why do some stick to the red? You can see that the blue sticks to the red, but the green sticks to the white. That's weird. Why do the whites repel each other? We saw that earlier, but oh no, wait, this has white. Nothing's happening. Hey, so the different colors must be different elements. That's an awesome observation, Kelly. And I love it when my students get to that point too. And they do get there. That tactile modeling of the pieces is a really great way to elicit those questions. So at this point, we would have addressed that this shape is our primary, primary shape. Um, we would have talked about the fact that what do you think it is? A lot of times students will be able to get that it is water or H2O. And then we talk about, well, what must these colors represent? Of course, the models are not labeled. Um, and so we would be adding that on. And why do you think it has this shape? And, um, and where, why must the reds and the whites be attracted to each other? So now we're adding some chemistry in. And in my county, my district, um, they haven't had really any chemistry since fifth grade. Um, which is a little crazy. And so we start to talk about magnets and positives and negatives and, and start talking about that polar shape. All right, so here we want to look at how water interacts with other water molecules. And one of the first things that I always ask my students is how many water molecules can one water interact with? And how does it feel when those waters interact with each other? And how does it feel when you pull that oxygen, that hydrogen cap off of the oxygen? Then we talk about the fact that they feel different. Can anybody, is anybody doing this with us? Can you feel that tactile difference? So that's one of the really awesome things about this kit. One of the things that my students always remember is how weak and easy it is to pull apart that hydrogen bond. And whenever I'm talking about hydrogen bonds throughout the year, we always think back to those water molecules and how easy that was and how um, challenging the covalent bond is. So now we'll look at one water molecule, like I said, and how many waters can one water molecule bond with? And this is something that students had traditionally struggled with. 
in um, picturing before I started using the models in class. And so actually modeling and seeing that central water molecule and the three, four other ones, see they, because you're moving it around, you can really see that it is four other water molecules um, in that classic shape. That's always something that's covered on my state standards. Um, I'm in Virginia and we have our own standards. So that's always something that's asked about. All right, so now just to kind of brainstorm what types of um, properties of water do you think that you can show with these kits? How, um, yeah, this is a great time for questions. How do you think that you could use these in your class already? Um, and how do you think, or if you think that they can elicit any questions from your students, you're welcome. Oh, I know those ion dipole forces. It's absolutely fantastic. It just jump right in with that tomorrow. Yay. Anybody else, any questions or comments, any thoughts? Also adding the hydrogen bond and the covalent. That is like this, these models do that so well. There's not any other model that I have seen or experienced that really show that difference of strength so well and uh, my kids like they just remember that for forever all right well feel free to keep dropping things in the chat we're going to explore on yes such a great difference um and yes they're really just attractions not actually permanent bonds that is really really powerful so right now we're showing how molecules would be spaced far apart as a gas and then as that temperature comes down they would stop moving so speedily um, and start to bond in our liquid water form. So you're just having the kids kind of play with that. And then we would start to look at how, as you continue to drop those temperatures, how the water molecules actually form in such much more rigid and complex shapes. So these are the crystal forms of ice. Um, there are two different forms of ice, but if you notice, look at how we just fit a water molecule into those structures of ice. So really showing how much space there is in those crystalline structures and how that is the structure that allows for the function of a lower density of our solid form. Then we can put some multiple ice um, structures together to even form a snowflake. All right, so looking at how this is how we form one of the, the structures of ice. So it's a, a very set structure, very rigid structure. So you, to me, that kind of looks like a little, um, a little dog and then we add little wings to him. So he's a dragon and then big floppy ears. And then you connect the ears to the wings. It's a weird animal now, but this is how I remember and how I, I teach my students. And then we pull the feet off or the tail off and um, connect all that. And so now we have one of the structures of ice. This method um, is the other structure of ice. Does not have a good story, at least to my knowledge. I don't have a good story for that one. Um, this one is a little bit more challenging for my students to make um, at the introductory level, but it is a really nice structure. So we have hexagonal and cubic ice, and we're gonna put these structures together now. Um, now in order to, and make a big snowflake, in order to make this snowflake, you do need seven different one cup kits. Um, so this is not something that you would be able to do um, with even just one or two cups um, or even a few of the student modeling packs. I do have um, the 10 cup kit. Uh, I splurged uh, a few years ago and um, it is really just kind of a powerful structure to be able to make this um, snowflake. And as you can see, there's a little bit of trial and error as you go to put the pieces together, the individual forms of ice, the individual ice structures. As you can see so far we have five of the ice structures. We're adding our sixth one now. There we go. And then our last, our seventh, and we have a almost half. <laughs> the 
giant snowflake. Look at that snowflake. Um, so super fun to be able to make. Um, there are, we've dropped some directions for making the two ice structures if that was a little fast for you in um, the chat. So please feel free to reference those. Super fun to make ice. All right, so now we're gonna look at some of the other properties of water. So here, as we've already demonstrated, this is just liquid water. And you could take a little plastic butterfly or insect or just some pom-poms glued together as we have here. And of course, what are we modeling when we're setting something on top but surface tension? All right, and then of course I use for this, this is um, of course transpiration and um, when I, in capillary action, and when I'm modeling this, I just use my whiteboard, just draw a big tree and you can show, this is a nice stop motion animation, um, but very easy to show how the water comes up through the roots of the trees and then is able to be pulled along through our adhesive and cohesive properties up through the xylem and into the leaves to be used and then turn into water vapor if necessary and evaporate. All right, and so here we have looking at how water can interact with other molecules. We're looking specifically at um, salt or sodium chloride. We can see that the hydrogen bonds to the chloride. When we start to um, add more and more water molecules to this salt, molecule to the chloride in the salt, we can see that we start to form that hydration shell and that we the sodium and the chloride will separate so that that last water molecule can bond. And that is how the salt dissolves and is pulled apart from the larger salt cube. And that the same thing would happen to your sodium, but of course, they are different ions, so different parts of the water will be attracted to it. Of course, we have the oxygen, negative oxygens being attracted to the positive sodiums. I love that. My chemistry teachers really love to show that, even though um, they will have already had it with me. Um, they, they do like that repetition, and it really solidifies that, getting that a second year in chemistry. So here you have, remember, you have methane, and I have ethane, so I just have an extra carbon um, with hydrogens. And remember from our first plane that there is no attraction, that our methane is nonpolar, so there's, there's no charges. If you notice, there's some little arrows. We're pointing out those little arrows on your structure. And that's really important. We want to actually remove our hydrogen and the little, little pole that hydrogen sticks on where those three arrows point to a hydrogen. And then we can take in a one cup kit, we have a hydroxyl group. Now you don't have a hydroxyl group, but you could easily make that hydroxyl group with a student modeling kit by just removing one of your hydrogens. And now we have turned our um, nonpolar into a alcohol and that alcohol, that hydroxyl and alcohol can interact with more waters. So again, just adding a little chemistry there. Now these digital resources are absolutely phenomenal. What I did with them, um, is we played with the models one day. I am face-to-face, -face, um, have the privilege of being face-to-face, -face, but um, on lab day, I can't have as many students back in the lab. So when we were doing our traditional water lab, my half of my class was at the computers in the front of the classroom playing with these slides. This is really great because we can see the chemical structure in a different representation um, and uh, more traditional. And then they can play with each of the three models here to move those pieces and form and see the interactions. And we can see how all of these models are the same, yet all are slightly different. For some of them, they do need to rotate, such as this one. But for the first one, they don't need to rotate anything. So again, just showing students how a little bit of different um, resources, a little different visualization um, can be helpful to look at the same molecule. They were good. So how can you use these, um, this kit, these pieces, these water molecules in your different classes? We've clearly covered water chemistry here at biology level. In the life science classes, um, our teachers use them for 
modeling water cycle, for looking at osmosis the first time, and even when talking and discussing about eutrophication. In biology, clearly we've just discussed all the water chemistry, but I also use them in cell membrane structure to show how those phospholipids orient. There is an aquaporin story um, that we can find uh, one of our 10 time lectures, how the aquaporin channel works and um, relating that to our water molecules, obviously. Also the structure of protein channels. Again, that hydrogen bonding and how easy it is to separate and bond that um, just how, how kinesthetic that is, sorry. Um, I refer back to that when I'm teaching about DNA structure, replication, protein synthesis, anytime those hydrogen bonds need to easily be broken and then come back together. Our chemistry teachers love these kits when they're talking about phase of water, when they're talking about hydrogen bonding, the ionic salts and dissolving, and then of course strip crystal structures, um, they also build those ice structures. All right, so I think I just blew through that really fast. <laughs> um, so we used in this kit, we focused on our one cup water set. You were modeling if you um, registered in advance with the water student modeling kit. And I have the 10 cup water set that was used to um, make the snowflake. Um, so at this time, let's open it up to questions. Have you used models in the past? Um, how do you foresee? I know some of you already chatted with us about your excitement and using them tomorrow in class, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but what, what do you foresee? How do you think that this can help you in the class? Thank you, Alice. And um, I also want to draw your attention that Heather Ryan um, has some of the models right there. If you can't find, if you don't see Heather's screen, go ahead and scroll through the participants and try to find Heather Ryan. Um, she has some of the water molecules there. And Heather, do you have an aquaporin? I do have, and I have a fancy new aquaporin. This is a prototype for a brand new model. And, and let me switch to my overhead camera and we'll see if you can see this a little bit better you might oh sorry i forgot to turn it on <laughs> technical difficulties here we go okay and you may want to take down the um slide that you're sharing at the moment chris so when we talk about membranes and kim will be doing this a little bit more um in our next session she will um we'll be talking about how water crosses those membranes. And so if you can see the red and white here, these are our little water molecules. And it's in this, um, I don't know, barrel is the type correct um, term to use, but this protein is a series of these um, alpha helices. And you'll see that we have half of them are colored in blue and half of them are in green. And we can actually open this up and you can see the water molecules that are traveling here, um, they start to go through the, um, the channel um, on this one side and they're all facing uh, one way on this side and they are interacting with this asparagine in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the channel. And then on this other half, you'll see that there is another asparagine here on this side. And actually at that point, those water molecules flip their orientation going from one way to the other as they travel through that membrane. So I know that there are some other protein structure points that Tim maybe wanted to make. So if you want to add anything here. Yeah. Or something me, about yeah. the number of, um, of alpha helices, correct Tim? Yeah, that's uh, so, Aquaporin is a member of a family of proteins known as a seven helix bundle. So when you look at that, there are seven alpha helices, right? Three wow. red, or I'm sorry, three blue and three green. And then if you look, that makes six helices. So why do we call it a seven helix bundle? Well, if you look at the seventh helix, you see that it's not one continuous helix. It's half of a green abutted to half of a blue. And this is, this is a very subtle point, but this is actually the product of um, 
gene duplication because the aquaporin is actually two genes that kind of got duplicated and put together. So it makes for a seven helix bundle that is sort of symmetrical right down the middle. Now, is that important for your kids to know? No, but man, it sure is cool when you see how evolution has, has figured out, if you will, how to selectively transport water across a membrane. Um, there are all kinds of little interesting stories that each one of these proteins have to tell us. Okay. I haven't been watching the chat. Are there anything that we should be talking about here? Another way that it can be good to show that attraction on the screen is if you have a water molecule on a string and you can um, really show how then it attracts with the, those hydrogen bonds. Or if you have those two, um, if you try to put two whites, um, then you will see how that actually can push away or it's moving that molecule as I'm um, trying to make the wrong bonds there. <laughs> I guess one more comment I can make, and I, Alice, you may have already made this and I missed it, but you know, all models are wrong, right? And when you use models, you really have to be aware of the fact that you may be teaching a misconception. And one of the things we, we probably should explicitly address when kids use these models is you don't want them to think that atoms are like magnets with a north and a south pole. So magnets are simply useful to model the hydrogen bonding, the polar nature of water. But um, it's probably good for us to explicitly have that conversation with kids after they've used this model, just to make sure they understand we're using magnets in this very effective way. But it's not like each atom has a north and a south pole and that magnetism is involved in some way in bonding between atoms. <laughs> so uh, that's a danger of using models or this particular model anyway. Yeah, it is, Tim. Um, I definitely will second that. I know even in my um, lowest level classes, we talk about that. We talk about how every model is different yeah. um, and how, you know, this is a model yep. and why we're using magnets to model that. So that's an excellent point. But it is something that I see that students of all ages can really wrap their heads around once you talk about them. Yeah. So. Okay. So I'll just keep talking about things. <laughs> <laughs> so we were showing um, you some of our ice videos before and how to make those structures. And the one that doesn't have the story around it, <laughs> you there is um, there are some great patterns that you can really have your students look for here. And you'll see, actually, let me. I'll use Tim's fancy pointer here. <laughs> we will, we'll see how this works. And so you can see that there are three um, water molecules here that are standing up or really have those hydrogens pointing up. And then there are three that are um, on that opposite orientation where they are pointing um, towards the front here. And so if you can make rings like this, you really, if, if you can duplicate these rings, that's all you need to do to make those snowflakes. So I always start by holding a, um, a central um, water molecule, and then I add two that stand up on each side. And then we follow up on each of those that go on the bottom. This is when it gets floppy and is usually better to have on the table. But then when you add that, third or that last one, then you get these. When you have two rings that are identical then, really the trick is to turn one so it's 180 degrees. Um, so it's essentially opposite of the first one and then you can just stack them on top like that. And I always build my ice cubes for some reason with all my hydrogen spacing up. And then when I make my snowflake, I turn them all so that they're, the red is up. I don't know why. 
So the, the water molecules are great for pattern recognition and having your students um, do some of, of those activities because it can um, help them start to look for details. Absolutely. And if you're a virtual teacher, you can see even how Heather is modeling this for us, how easy this is. So you, you, you lose, of course, a little bit of the power of the students playing with it. But for that pattern recognition, they can still gather a lot just with you modeling and, and showing mm -hmm. and then having them answer the questions and making observations. And you can see that how all of these rings are all facing in that same way. And this is the snowflake that you can make with the six cup set. So yeah. as long as you don't put one in the middle there, you've got it. The other thing I like to do when we are talking about ice and we're showing, you know, how much space there is, there's really room to, you know, put your finger through. And so that that room for that extra, that extra water molecule is pretty evident there when your students are able to, to model ice. Okay. What questions do you have for us? You're hanging around. So <laughs> <laughs> we didn't show, I have a sodium chloride lattice here. Let me do a little bit more with this. So we offer sodium chloride as an additional um, kit. If you would like a lattice, we do three by three and four by four. And with these, you can do lots of different things, but we can really show that close packing. And if we go back to overhead camera here, you might be able to see that a little bit better where you can see how closely um, packed the ions are. And even though they are the different sizes, and then we can also show how it will cleave off in planes. So it just twists off and we still keep that, um, really that lattice structure. And then we can talk about how water molecules actually surround our um, sodium chloride ions. And so that this is when um, you dissolve salt in water you will, um, your water actually binds to all the available surfaces that we can. So seeing in this one corner, and then that's when it starts to pull um, these guys off and we can show then a fully hydrated ion. Jim, you should mention your summer courses. Yes, I will. Um, so this water kit is actually one of our foundational models. Um, the Center for Biomolecular Modeling, what we're really most interested in is protein structure. And what we learned early on as we started talking with teachers about proteins and how they fold, we, we appreciated that you first have to understand the polar nature of water to really understand how or why hydrophobic amino acid side chains try to hide from the water that they're floating in. So we use this in a, in, our, in a summer course called Modeling the Molecular World. And this is uh, sort of the introductory course to how you can use models to teach all aspects of uh, the biological sciences. So I would encourage all of you to uh, come and spend five days with us in Milwaukee in the summer of 2022. <laughs> Because unfortunately, in the summer of 2021, this next summer, as of right now, it looks like that will be a virtual workshop. So we will have a Modeling the Molecular World summer course or workshop. But right now, we're planning on hosting that virtually. So it'll be a combination of uh, live Zoom sessions like this. But the one difference is that um, if you sign up for that workshop, you'll receive a big box of models in the mail so that as we work through the models all week long, then you'll have a chance to actually use and manipulate those models there um, at your desk, at your table as we're working through those. So it's not an ideal way to run these workshops, but um, we're going to do it. And um, we, we look forward to seeing some of you uh, in that modeling the molecular world. 
check out our website. Uh, that is the CBM website. You might have to give us another week or so because we're just now updating the information on that website. Uh, right now you can find the date of the workshop, but there's no information right now that says it's going to be virtual. But uh, that's a decision we've made just in the last week or so. There was a question about if this model is available for sale and not yet. We are working on developing um, some more plastic um, models. We do have a small plaster version of Aquaporin, has a different coloring scheme, but you do still open it up so that you can see the water. And so right now uh, we just released a series of um, coronavirus plastic models. And this was an early prototype, so this I don't actually have any of the ones that we're selling now um, here with me. But you can see um, that you know we I have two beta globin models in different sizes, so we're really going to be looking at all of our backbone type models to see how we can produce these in the plastic. Here's the GFP um, protein, and so we really have to figure out what is the best scale and um, figure out the production on those. And but we hopefully will be releasing those in the spring. The thing you should emphasize, Heather, is these new models will be plastic and therefore not nearly as breakable as the earlier generation of plaster models. But, they, but you still do need plastic. to be careful. So <laughs> the plastic ones are still going to break. We've had some spike proteins that broke off uh, early coronavirus models. So even when they're plastic, they are um you can still break them so but um we do think they'll be less expensive we'll be able to get larger models at a less expensive price that are a little bit more durable you just ruined the message i was trying to convey i know but we can't say that they don't break because they do <laughs> I'd also like to, um, Alice talked a little bit about our digital activities and those activities are freely available on our website. Um, they're in PowerPoint and Google slide version. And so I hope you can see my screen here. You can move these molecules around. Um, see if I'm doing it right. And all of these um, also include some editable text boxes with some questions that are included, or you can just erase those questions and put in your own. So if you are teaching virtually and you need some more hands-on uh, or manipulating of molecules, these are available on our website as well. So please feel free to check those out and you just have your students uh, do a PDF and send them back to you. Okay. really amazing um and my my kids struggled a little bit with them but i like it when they struggle a little bit because then that means the the learning's going to be a little stronger so they were awesome resources great so we appreciate a lot of resources over the last few months um, particularly to help during this time of the coronavirus um we've been doing more videos for teachers and other resources so please go to 3D Molecular Designs and Teacher Resources, check out, um, do a search for videos, whatever you need. And if you don't find it, send us an email and let us know what you need help with. We'd um, always appreciate knowing what teachers are looking for. And I think that wraps us up for today. So I really appreciate you guys joining us. Thank you, Alice, for your great Thank session. You, Alice. And wow. we please join us for Kim's um, session on membranes. Do you have membrane. that slide, Chris? It's uncovering student thinking with models, membrane and transport. And that's at 1.30 with Kim Parfit. Okay. Join Thank us. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone.